Yeah. All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoyed the first session. I enjoyed it. Let's give Pastor Jay Kumar a good uh, hand. Oh, right here. <laughs> Thank you. You know, while you were talking, I was just having a thought in my mind. Maybe we should do this in other cities as well. Uh, not only in Bangalore, but take this, this particular topic, I think, you know, every man's battles and just do it in other cities. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we've got some questions coming, uh, but we will take, we'll respond to the questions after lunch. If you have questions, you're welcome to uh, send it and they will share it with us and we'll address the questions uh, after our lunch, in the sessions that come in after our lunch. All right, so um, in our first session, we, you know, we, we just pointed at the problems that are common to all of us as men. We are all facing these challenges, these are our battles. Battles that all of us face, none of us are exempt from it. But of course, we want to talk about the biblical pathway to victory and learn how to live victorious on earth as we face all of these challenges. And so that's what we want to talk about uh, in the sessions that, uh, that go on from here. So session two, if you, you can follow with me in your uh, handouts, please. Uh, I want to just, we want to just emphasize on the call to godliness and as believers that we are called to a lifestyle of godliness. We don't have to live in submission or in control to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These are genuine challenges. We're not denying them. We all face them, but we are called to live victorious. And then in session three, we'll talk about what God's provision is and how do we actually practically live victorious in these areas. But I want to just place before us the, the fact that we have to choose victory. And we make that deliberate choice. Yes, I know there are challenges. I know that these are struggles all of us face. But we can make the choice to live victorious, the choice to live godly in an ungodly world. The choice to live above all of these things. And the first thing that I feel is important for us is that we need to be very clear in our minds that Christ is our example and Christ's likeness is our goal. It's very clear. We, in this world, it's, it's, it's good to have a you know, got examples of good people. People inspire us. So, you know, uh, in, in various areas of life, we, look, we have some role models. We look at people. So, hey, I like to be like that. And maybe in a successful athlete or uh, a successful businessman or a successful professional. We, we have those models. We, you know, it's, it's okay. But when it comes to living a life of godliness... There's only one model or one example that we have to fix our eyes on. That Christ is our example and Christ's likeness is our goal. Now, even in this area of living godly, yes, we can draw inspiration from other godly men and women. You look at them, yeah, they're living godly lives. We can draw inspiration, but don't forget that people are valuable. The people will fall, and that's when sometimes we get the hardest knock because we are looking at somebody, you know, a, a, a human person as our example, and then suddenly they make a blunder, they make a mistake, or they fall. It hits us hard, right? It, it really sometimes even shakes our faith. And that's why it's so important for us, while we do honor, you know, the lives of godly men and women and all of that, and, and we can draw inspiration. We must be clear in our minds. Jesus is my example. And he is my standard. And he's my goal. That's it. Thank God for all the godly men around me who can inspire me. But my eyes must be fixed upon Jesus. So let's consider that. Uh, the Bible teaches us very plainly that, you know, and try to picture this in your mind as well. Try to imagine this. This is the God of heaven, the God of glory, the eternal God, who takes on humanity. And when he comes in human form, yes, he is 
God, but on purpose, he has chosen, he made the deliberate choice to live as a man. And he faced the same kinds of temptations that you and I face. Same things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Same things. And as though, you know, God wanted to give us a little idea of that, we have the temptation of Jesus recorded for us. And the devil came exactly in these three areas. You know, convert, make the stones. If, if you are the son of God, make these stones bread. If you are the son of God, I'll give you, you know, all the kingdoms of this world. You just bow down and worship me. If you are the son of God, jump from the temple. Angels will hold you up and everybody else will clap and, you know, they'll celebrate you. So in these same three areas, as though to give us a little idea that the God of heaven in his humanity, limiting himself to what, you know, what defines a human. We're not taking away from the fact that he is deity, but he walked in humanity and he faced the same temptations you and I face. He faced it. So look at you know, Hebrews 4.15. He was tempted. No, he, he, he understands our weaknesses. Because in all points he was tempted. So he understands, literally. Not like a distant God, oh yeah, I, I'm sorry for you, you're going through this. No, it's almost like saying, hey, I was there. I was there. I feel your weakness. I, I, can, I understand exactly what you're saying. Because I was there. He sympathizes, he understands our weakness. Hebrews 2 again says, you know, like in all things he was made like us, so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. And verse 18, he himself suffered being tempted. He suffered being tempted. Think about that. Because he felt the pain. He suffered being tempted. Now you and I face, oh God, this is too much. You know, some, some struggles. God, this is too much. God, I don't think I can come through. God, it's too much of emotional pressure. It's too much of, you know, whatever. He suffered being tempted. You and I, sometimes our temptations are, oh, it's hard. But Jesus went through the same thing. He suffered being tempted. And it says, end of verse 18, Hebrews 2. He is able to aid those who are tempted. So now, he's actually coming to assist us. He's actually saying, I'll help you through this. You know, so all of life's struggles, all of these battles that you and I face, and we're just saying, okay, lust of the flesh, pride of, lust of the eyes, pride of life, these are big categories. But whatever challenge you and I are facing, he's gone through it. And he's saying, I'm able to help you. I feel what you feel. I actually went through it, suffering, and I'm here to help you through it. So, and he was without sin. I mean, he overcame. And so he's, he's our perfect example. In John 14, verse 30, Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, you know, the ruler of this world is coming. But he's got nothing in me. And that's the place you and I must strive to get to. It's like, you know, we can't prevent the devil from coming. As long as we are on this earth, he's going to come. Temptations are going to come. But there's no entry point. There is no landing point. The rule of the world is coming. That he has nothing in me. You know, and I really want us to desire to come to such a place where you know, we can actually walk around and say, devil, you come as many times as you want. There's nothing. There's no open door in my life. There's no landing ground in my life. I mean, that's how Jesus walked. The rule of the world is coming. He's got nothing in me. And if you and I, with the grace of God, and what we're going to see in the next session, are able to bring ourselves into that place. And I'm not saying that we are going to uh, live uh, recklessly or live in a way that 
we're not on guard. We always have to be on guard. But if we can come to this place where everything in our life is so submitted to God, every door is closed, every space in our life is consecrated, then we could say what Jesus said. The devil may come, but he's got nothing in me. He can knock behind me, in front of me, on the side. He can knock on my ear gate, my eye gate, my emotion gate. He can knock on any gate he wants. There's no open door, not even a window. And he can try to land in any space, whether it's concerning money, whether it's concerning women, whether it's concerning emotions, motivations, ambitions, any space he can try to land, there's no landing ground. If we can bring ourselves into that space, that kind of posture before God, the same posture that Jesus walked in on the earth, it'll be so powerful. Are you able to get that kind of a picture? Yes? So that's, I'm not saying we are there, but that's what we should journey to. The devil comes, the rule of this world is coming. He has nothing in me, no place, nothing. Every part of me should be kept under the lordship and submission to Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to make this possible. 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Now, generally when we, we think about Jesus coming to take away our sins, we think in terms of forgiveness, which is true. He came to pay for our sins so we could be forgiven. But in the context of 1 John 3, the context is he came to take away our sins so that we don't have to sin. That means he came to take away our very propensity for sin. So not only just to pay for our sins so we could be forgiven, but to take away our sinfulness, our inclination, our propensity to sin. He came to take that away. So that you and I don't have to sin. That you and I don't have to uh, be slaves to any of these passions. Will temptations be there? Always be there. As long as we're in this world. But we are in a place where like Jesus, we could say, these sins have nothing in me. So, Christ-likeness is our goal. In Ephesians 4, 13 and 15, what is God's will for us? Is God's, God's will that we all come to the unity of the faith, to knowing Jesus, and coming to this mature person who's, who's in the full measure of Christ. That means we grow up to be like Christ. That's God's will. Right? And he says in verse 15, that in all things we may grow up to be like Jesus. That in all things, all areas, we grow up to be like Jesus. So that's our goal. And he said, God, in all my areas, in how I uh, deal with uh, the area of my sexuality, the area of my passions, my ambitions, every area, I want to be like Jesus. That's the goal. And that is the Father's will. That's God's will for you and me. You look at Romans 8, 29. He said, this is God's will, God's plan from the beginning. For whom he foreknew, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So God says, okay, that's my plan for you. I want you to be like Jesus. He predestined or he predetermined. He had this plan. I want you to be like Jesus. Be conformed to that image. Be like him. So your prayer, my prayer, Jesus, I want to be more like you. In the area of my battles, in the area of my struggles, Lord Jesus, I want to be more like you. How I relate to women, I want to be more like Jesus. How I look at women, I want to be more like Jesus. How I deal with money, I want to be more like Jesus. How I deal with every area, all, whatever battles, it can be a long list. But every area of battle and struggle that you and I face as men, our prayer is, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. So he's the example. And he's our goal. Amen? All with me so far? Right? So, let's talk about now this call 
to godliness. I want us to, and I know this might, you know, uh, seem redundant, like, yeah, yeah, we know it's, it's obvious. As believers, God's called us to godliness. But let's just look at it from Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 2 to 8. I'm reading from the Passion Translation, just puts it in plain English. Uh, sometimes the King James or the New King James is a little difficult to understand. But the Passion Time makes it just plain. Please follow with me. Verse 2. For you already know the instructions we shared with you through the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be set apart for him in holiness. That you keep yourselves unpolluted from sexual defilement. Yes, each of you must guard your sexual purity with holiness and dignity. Not yielding to lustful passions like those who don't know God. Never take selfish advantage of a brother or sister in this matter. For we've already told you and solemnly warned you that the Lord is the avenger in all these things. For God's call on our lives is not to a life of compromise and perversion, but to a life surrendered, surrounded in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this instruction isn't rejecting human authority, but God himself, who gives us his precious gift, his spirit of holiness. So this makes, you know, this, this is plain and simple. Very clear. God's called all of us to a place of holiness, as we heard in the earlier session. God gave us our sexual desires, our appetites. He designed us that way. The way he designed us was perfect. Nothing wrong with that. But we have to guard all our appetites, all our affections, all our emotions, and keep it consecrated before God. That's a call. So I want you to do that. And verse 4, you guard your sexual purity or guard all your appetites. God, guard all your emotions. God, uh, guard all your desires with holiness and dignity. So you must guard. That responsibility is on you and me. And we want to learn some practical things in the next session. Okay? How do I practically do this? Looking from the scriptures. How do I guard all my appetites, God-given, all my desires, all my ambitions? How do I guard that with holiness and dignity? Verse 6, I don't, must not do anything to violate another person. That's so important, right? Don't violate another brother, sister, or it's another person, another human being. Whether it's an active violation or a passive violation, don't do anything. To violate another brother or sister. Because it says verse 6. The Lord is the avenger. So there is that godly fear. And not this morbid fear. But recognizing that hey. If I violate someone else. That person may be weak. Sometimes even. In a position where they cannot. Speak up, but there's somebody in heaven who's their avenger, meaning who will take care of that. Right? There's a, that, that reverence inside our hearts, a godly fear that I cannot violate someone else. Even if they are weak and powerless to speak up, there's a God in heaven who will avenge them. That sense of reverence grips our hearts. Verse 6. So God's call, what is God's call? He's called us not to, to a life of compromise and perversion, but to a life of holiness, surrounded by holiness. So that's the call. That as we are walking in a, in a wicked and a perverse and a dark world, God is saying, I called you. Not to a life of compromise or perversion. That has nothing to do with you. Your life is a life surrounded by holiness. That's God's call. Amen? So, try to again envision this. Everything about you, everything in your life, 
comes to a place of absolute holiness. Holiness becomes your norm. Holiness becomes your default. Holiness fills your world, your space. In a world that sure is wicked, is perverse, all those things are around us, but you are in a space, let me use the word bubble, <laughs> you're in a holiness bubble if you want. You, you, you're there because you stepped into it. That's God's call for you and me. Not to a life of compromise or perversion. So, try to look at this. We all have phones. But this is a holy space. I use it for practical things. Communication, storing, do I, I mean, all these practical things that I need. There are tools on it that I use. But it's a holy space. Nothing unclean will ever come on this. I guard it. You guard it. Everything else, same, similarly, your computer, your interactions with people, uh, your finances, everything is holy. You've come into that holiness bubble because that's God's call on your life. And that becomes your norm. Amen? And... That's what I want us to envision, and we will learn how to step into that, you know, in, in our, our next session. So, when it comes to sexual appetites, we all have them, but they are in a place of purity. When it comes to money, thank God for it, we all make money, but you're in a place of generosity. That means it's not controlling you. You're looking at God, how can I serve your purposes with this? When it comes to fame, name, recognition, yeah, it comes. If you're successful, people recognize you, obviously. If you're doing well, people recognize you. So it will come. And even if it comes, you are in a place of humility. So it doesn't shake you. Uh, you're not paying attention to it. You're not paying attention. You're not even thinking about fame. It will come. If you're successful, yeah, it'll come. You're not running. You're not trying to build it up. But it's coming because you're doing well. But you're already in a place of humility. When it comes to control, meaning your position of leadership or influence, depending on, you know, we all are in different positions. But... You're in that place where you actually have authority. You actually have control. But you're exercising that through a heart of servanthood or through service. You all with me so far? So that's the posture. That's the place that we want to be in. And in all these matters, when it comes to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we are in a place where we are responding to God's call of holiness, surrounding ourselves with what constitutes holiness. So let's think about this. You know, uh, we are motivated, just naturally the way we are built or designed, we are motivated when we see, okay, this is going to be the outcome of me taking this action or journeying this path. So let's think about the blessings of godliness. If we live godly in this world, the world tells us you will lose. They tell us untruths. Right? They tell us, oh, you're going to lose out. Uh, if you're godly in this world, you cannot be a success. And we say, hey, I've proved you wrong. I'll be godly and I'll show you you can be successful. I'll be godly and I'll show you I can be happy. I don't need to sin to be happy. I don't need to sin or I don't need to you know, do all those things in order to say what the world says you, you need, you're going to accomplish. God has said that when we walk in godliness, there are so many blessings. I'll just, you know, summarize them very quickly. Number one, the greatest blessing is our intimacy with God. Right? You and I, if we walk in godliness, this is the greatest thing. You're close to God. And we were having a discussion at our table, and Tony was saying, the love of the Father, you know, the Father's love, love of the Father. 
you, you, you just enjoy the Father's love. That, that comes by just living a life of godliness. It, you have that intimacy with God. God is setting apart for himself, Psalm 4 verse 3, him who is godly. Think about this. When you and I choose to walk in godliness, God is saying, hey, you're mine. The world will laugh at us, reject us. Hey, what is this? But God is saying, you're special to me. Okay? Psalm 4 verse 3. The Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. And God says, hey, you're, you're godly. Hey, you're special. Come on. It's almost like you become, it's not true, but you become like God's favorite child. Right? He sets you apart for himself. Of course, you know, God doesn't have favorites. He invites all of us in. But that's what he does when we make a choice on godliness. He sets us apart for himself. You're special to me because you've made a choice for godliness. The world can despise, world can reject, they can make fun. They go, oh, what is this? It's okay. If the whole world rejects, but God makes me special, that's worth everything. Amen? So understand that. That when you choose godliness, when you choose to be godly, when you choose to say no to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride, all these things, you choose to say, and you're Pursuing holiness in the fear of God. God is saying you're special to me. So that's a great place to be in. Number two. Godliness is profitable. The apostle Paul wrote this. You know, he says bodily exercise profits a little. So there's some benefit there. But godliness is profitable. Or it brings benefit for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, godliness has dividends both in this life as well as in eternity. You know, the world tries to tell us the other way. Hey, godliness, you're going to lose out on a lot. No, 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 no. The Bible says, Paul wrote here, godliness has rewards in this life and in the life to come. So don't believe the lie of the world. God said, Godliness is profitable, it's beneficial, has rewards, brings dividends in this life and in the life to come. That's the truth. That's what I'll believe. That's what I'll stay with. Amen? So choosing this life of godliness. You know, what are some things? And I just put a few bullet points there, page 10. You know, first of all, it gives you confidence. You know, think about a person who is living a compromised life. You know, he's maybe cheating on his wife, cheating on his finances, doing all these wrong things there. You know, it's not, it's just, there's so much things he has to cover up, so many things he has to hide. And they have to lie to cover up things. You know, keep four or five passwords so nobody else breaks it on his phone. <laughs> See what he's doing, you know. Go online in incognito mode and make sure nobody's watching all those. Why are you living godly? It's so free. And you're confident all the time because they say, there's nothing to hide. Nothing to worry about. Just living. It's normal. So there's that total personal confidence in everything. You're not ashamed. You're not trying to cover things up. That... There's personal security. The Bible says he who walks with integrity walks securely. You walk in godliness. You walk in purity. It just creates security in your life. Because there's nothing people can hold against you or me. And you can just enumerate so many other things. You're a blessing to your family and friends. People celebrate you. Wow. And you're, you're a blessing to your family. You're a blessing to... Uh, those around you. You have a positive influence. People look at you and say, I want to be like that. I want to follow that example. They, they receive inspiration from your life. So you're, you, you have a positive influence because you made a choice to live a godly life. So godliness has benefit in this life and in the life to come. 
We should be convinced about it. Amen? And number three, very important, is, you know, all of us desire to be used by God. All of us desire to serve God. God, I want my life to be useful for your kingdom. And one of the criteria, Paul tells us very clearly, is that we, if we choose to set ourselves apart, then God can work through us. In 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, he says, In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. If anyone, I mean, this is an open invitation. Hey, anyone can step into this. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that means from what is dishonorable, he is choosing to get clean house, keep these dirty things off. He's making the choice. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, what will happen to him? He will be a vessel for honor sanctified or set apart and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So this is a big motivation. God, if I choose to cleanse myself, I choose to keep all this dirt out of my life. I can present myself to you. And then God says, you'll be a useful vessel and you'll be fit for every Good work. Every good work. Now, this is a big motivation. So, as we make deliberate choices to clean house, get rid of these things. In our battles, yes, it's a battle, it's a fight. And sometimes the fight may be intense as we try to overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and put these things out of our lives. It's maybe an intense battle, but... What will be the result? You will be a vessel. Useful. Fit for the master's use. And he will be able to release every good work through you. Whatever he has planned for your life. Whatever he's chosen for you. He'll be able to release it. And that's a great place to be. Amen? So, our call to godliness. First, Christ is our example. And Christ-likeness is our goal. God has called us. He's saying, this is my calling. That in a world of compromise and perversion, you, sir, you're in a place surrounded. Your world, your space is filled with holiness because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness has been given to you and me. And our motivation for godliness, just, I just mentioned three things. You can definitely add to this list. One, puts us in a place of intimacy with God, closeness with God. Second, we know it's going to bring us benefit on the earth. It, it will bless our present and our future. And third, we'll be vessels that God can work through. And therefore, we choose godliness in every situation. We choose godliness because I can be a vessel that God can work through. Every victory you gain, you are now qualified to impart to somebody else. So when you fight your battles, say, God, if I, once I gain victory in this area, I'm qualified to administer that victory to other people, to help other people in the same areas of struggles. We are all having the same struggles, but if each one of us, as we gain victory, you can administer that to somebody else. Amen? So, the next 30 minutes, uh, we'd like us in our tables. So, these table discussions are very important, right? So, it's not just these sessions here. The, the 30 minutes that we speak uh, is more to give us thought and guide us to Scripture. But the 30 minutes we have in our table discussion is a chance for us to share life with each other. Right? There are people all over here who have stories, who got experiences that we want you to share with others on the table uh, and that this gives us an opportunity to share with each other. So um, for, a person, for personal reflection, uh, think about three areas 
where you would like to see growth in Christ likeness? Your top three. I'm sure all of us will write all areas of our lives, but what are three areas that you want to see you know, where you really feel like I need to grow more to be like Jesus? Your top three. Just list that. That's for your personal reflection. Take about five minutes on that. And then after that, discuss these three questions or thoughts in your tables. Remember, these discussions are for an opportunity for you to share with each other. What you've learned, pass it on. It's a time for us to learn from each other. So that's why we're giving you know, 30 minutes for uh, table discussions. So number one, um, in addition to sexual addictions, these are money, fame, control that we've emphasized or focused on. What are some other areas that you can add to the list of every man's battles? What are the areas of challenges? Now, it's good to recognize it because then you know where we're going to focus our energies on. Number two, what are some practical ways we can constantly look to Jesus for help and look at Jesus as our example when we face our battles in different areas? So many times as we face our battles, the pull of that temptation, the pull of that battle seems so big it consumes us and then we forget I'm supposed to be looking to Jesus and I'm supposed to be looking at him so how do we do that practically in life and in, in what we go through how do you just share some things maybe you've learned something in your own spiritual journey share it on your table others can benefit from that number three in addition to the three blessings of godliness that we've listed what are some other benefits that you can add to this as we pursue godliness in all areas? So, you know, just share. So again, here you will have personal stories, you know. This is what God did in my life. Share that at your table. You can add to this list of uh, positive outcomes. And then please take some time to pray. Keep the last two minutes uh, before 12.30. Around that time, we'll close. Uh, pray in your table. Pray for each other. Pray victory. Pray blessing. Uh, to each other.